morning. I am Swati Devankar and welcome to the Infosys Prize interview with Professor Raj Chetty, the Social Sciences Laureate of the Infosys Prize 2020. Good morning, Professor Chetty, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Swati. Thank you. Uh, well, Professor Raj Chetty was awarded the Infosys Prize in Social Sciences in 2020 for his pioneering research on identifying barriers to economic opportunity and for developing solutions to help people escape from the poverty towards better life outcomes. His research and extraordinary ability to discern patterns in large data has the potential to induce major shifts in the discipline of economics. I just read out the short citation of your emphasis prize. Professor Chetty, how would you explain this and your work to a 10 year old? Thanks, Swati. So I think the way I would explain this work to a 10 year old is just to ask the simple question, how can we help all children like other 10 year olds have good chances of succeeding in their lives? So we see, uh, you know, through our own experiences, through the data that we're studying in our research, that children's chances of succeeding, you know, going on to have a good standard of living, to be healthy, to achieve their dreams vary greatly depending upon their circumstances. Some kids grow up in families and neighborhoods and go to the kinds of schools that help them succeed. Other kids don't have, unfortunately, those opportunities at present. That's true even within, you know, rich developed countries like the United States or European countries where there are still many kids who don't have great opportunities. And it's also true, of course, in developing countries where there are many people who may not have uh, the, the opportunity to realize their potential. And so at a big picture level, what we are trying to study is how we can improve equality of opportunity. How can you give everyone who wants to rise up uh, a shot of succeeding? And the way we do that is by using large data sets, so information, on thousands or millions of people where we can discern patterns in terms of the types of factors that, that help people succeed. So are there certain types of schools, certain types of uh, neighborhoods, housing policies that can uh, give more people better chances of, of rising up? And the, the, the big picture goal ultimately is to figure out how we can create a society where everyone, no matter what their background is, uh, has a great chance of um, rising up and achieving success. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, well, today you are a role model for many young researchers in this field and beyond. Uh, but would you be able to tell us uh, who or what inspires you? Yeah, um, I, one way I'd answer that question is just by uh, talking about four uh, portraits that I have on my wall in my office of four people who I see as very inspiring figures, uh, starting with uh, Marie Curie, who's of course a very famous scientist who won two Nobel Prizes. And I remember often growing up myself, uh, my dad would uh, note that, you know, the Curie family, incredible family of scientists, uh, something to kind of aspire to. Uh, and I remember that having an influence on me. And, you know, the, the Marie Curie, if you know about, about her background, kind of came from modest means and very much fits this kind of narrative that we were just talking about, that she was lucky to have the opportunities to kind of develop her talent and obviously had a huge influence on the world through her discoveries. Uh, another person um, is Kenneth Arrow, who is, I think, one of the most important economists of the, of the last century. So Ken Arrow is, is famous for basically developing economics into a rigorous, mathematically founded field. Uh, and so many of us who are working in the field today see ourselves as, you know, working from the building blocks that he and others created going back to the 1950s. Uh, and so one of the things I aspire to do in that context is to work on these important social issues, but do so with the level of rigor that, that people like him brought to these questions. Um, a third person who I literally look up to on the, on the wall is uh, Richard Feynman, who's a very famous physicist, also a Nobel laureate. Uh, and what Richard Feynman was very well known for is tremendous expositional ability. So he's an incredibly inspiring teacher. And so that's another thing I, I try to aspire to do. Uh, I think it's very important for us to try to inspire the next generation to continue to 
address these kinds of questions and problems. Um, and so, you know, I see him as a, as a person to try to live up to in that regard. And then finally, uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, who, of course, for many of us is a role model and an inspiring figure who's, uh, you know, brings together the ultimate focus on social change, right, and really uh, doing things that have reshaped the, the world in, in so many ways. Uh, and so for me, uh, while it would be hard to fill, you know, any one of those people's shoes, those are some of the things that I at least try to aspire toward, uh, excellence in doing rigorous scientific research, trying to teach and inspire the next generation, uh, having a social impact. And I hope through my work, I'll, I'll be able to inspire others to blend those ingredients as well. Uh, well, in his uh, congratulatory note, our jury chair Kaushik Basu remarks, and I quote, what makes his work outstanding is its methodological originality. His work has the potential to induce methodological shifts in economics and expand the reach of discipline. How did you decide to combine interdisciplinary approaches in your research method? So I think the way I came upon the methods that I'm using in our research, which just to briefly summarize, using big data to use the buzzword that people like to use nowadays, you know, often used in private sector contexts. We hear all the time about companies uh, using large data sets to improve the products they offer. Our group focuses on using that type of data in the U.S. from things like anonymized tax records, um, social network data, such data sources to try to address social and economic policy questions. How can we tackle inequality, reduce poverty, and so forth? And we do that, as you noted, by not coming at the questions from any one particular perspective, strictly as economists or strictly from a statistical point of view, but really trying to blend insights from sociology, psychology, data science, computer science, and all of that has been very helpful. And I think the way we come, came upon that combination of methods and the big data focus in particular is just going back to the basic questions. So in trying to understand, you know, why is it, if I look at my own family, I see very different uh, opportunities and outcomes for myself versus my cousins. And to me, intuitively, I trace that back to the opportunities our parents had one generation earlier, where my own parents happened to have the luck to be the ones in their family who got a higher education and their sisters and brothers didn't have uh, as many of those opportunities. Uh, you know, what we wanted to understand, you know, more systematically is why is it that we see such varied outcomes for different people? And I think when you're motivated by that question, you want to come at it from all the methods that you can bring uh, to get the best possible answer. Starting from having the best possible data, what I just shared with you is a single anecdote. Uh, is that kind of pattern true more broadly to other people's experiences? You know, are they shaped by the opportunities their parents had? To what extent is there a persistence of opportunity across generations? Well, we would really like to study that for everyone, not just, you know, for a few handful of people we, we happen to know, right? And so that's the power of having very large data sets to systematically look at what the patterns are in the data, where our kind of own intuitions are correct and where they might not be correct. Um, and then to really be willing to go beyond what we see in that data and bring in perspectives from many others who've been thinking about these issues for a long time. So sociologists, for instance, with a different toolkit, not so much the large scale quantitative work, but often qualitative ethnographic work where they're interviewing people, have a lot of insight into the challenges that uh, lower income people face. Uh, and I found that incredibly useful in developing hypotheses that we test. So I would say, you know, the short answer to your question would be, I don't see myself as being committed to a single method. I want to find the best possible answer to the big questions we're trying to address. And if that involves using different methods, then that's what we're going to try to do. Uh, well, uh, then working with hard data is supposed to be more straightforward than working with the unknowns. Uh, has it ever been more frustrating? Yeah, so I mean, I think initially when you start working on an empirical project, that is a project that's based on hard data, as you put it, 
you have the feeling that, oh, I'm just going to measure everything very clearly and have a clear answer immediately emerge. But what you start to realize as you do this work is there are always things when you start to look at the data that are very surprising, that don't look the way you thought they would look. You then try to figure out why that's the case. Uh, and it's a process of iteration that can often take several years to formulate you know, a clear understanding of the patterns we're seeing in the data, especially in the era of big data, where we have data sets with millions or sometimes even billions of observations. It's literally very easy to get lost in the data. Where do you start if I give you a data set with hundreds of variables and millions of observations? How do you cut that data and organize a set of patterns and tell a story, if you will, that will make sense and be useful in understanding something about the world? When I advise graduate students here at Harvard, um, many of them you know, are ambitious in making efforts to get new data, but then the big challenge comes in, how do I take this new data set that I've found and actually say something with it that sheds light on how the world works or what policies we can implement to improve things in the world? That can often be quite frustrating. It can be very challenging, but I think at the end of the day, it can also be very inspiring because when you see something really changing in the data in a very clear way, it's incredibly tangible uh, and it can influence how um, things are done in the world going forward. What drives you to come back to the same problem day after day? So I think what drives me to work on these issues day after day is just you know my own personal story of feeling like I was lucky to have the, the opportunities I do and in some sense, feel an obligation to pay it forward to the next generation. And the way I'd like to contribute and, and do that is to you know, really make progress in figuring out how we can help um, more kids uh, achieve, I think, the vast potential that they have. But you know, unfortunately, many of whom are not achieving that potential because they don't have the right sort of support, the right sort of structure. To me, that's an incredibly inspiring question. It's a question that I know lots of other people care about as well. Uh, and so that's very motivating to me. I also just enjoy thinking about these issues. I was drawn to economics and social science because I like math, like statistics, like thinking about things in this way. And so for me, uh, it's both uh, you know being inspired by what seem like important questions and kind of just having fun that I enjoy doing this sort of work. It doesn't feel like work uh, most days. And so it's very easy to be immersed in it. Thank you for sharing that with us, Professor. Your career so far has been absolutely remarkable. A PhD from Harvard at 23, from there to the faculty at University of California, and back here to your alma mater at Harvard. There's clearly been a very defined line of research throughout. But if not research, what alternative career would you have considered? So since a young age, I was very interested in uh, the sciences. So I come from a family of uh, physicians and scientists. My mom is a doctor. My dad is a statistician and economist. Uh, and my sisters went into uh, uh, science research. Uh, and so I was definitely in that environment uh, growing up. Uh, if I weren't to do economics, you know, when, while I was growing up, I was very interested in things like biomedical engineering and uh, trying to think about how you could um, do things in, in that space that might help improve people health, people's health and so forth. Uh, I think like many Indian kids, you always have medicine on your mind, if not on your own mind, put on your mind by those around you. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's another possibility I, I thought about. But I would say, you know, I was always interested in learning and trying to make progress in terms of uh, understanding things better. Uh, so I would say some form of science, if not economics per se. What would you say uh, to other aspiring researchers, especially during this frustrating year because of the pandemic and also in general? So what I would say to aspiring researchers is that there are vast possibilities to make a difference in the world through research. I mean, if you just think about the spectrum of things we've seen, even in this frustrating year of the pandemic, from the incredible science that went into creating vaccines that are going to fundamentally change the trajectory of this pandemic relative to where we were 
50 years ago or even 10 years ago, where a lot of those discoveries hadn't been made. I mean, it just shows you the power of science, right? That it, that's ultimately going to save an incredible number of lives and change how we are all getting to live our lives in the in the coming years. Uh, and so I think those kinds of stories are very inspiring in terms of how science can change the world. But we have to also recognize that these are complicated issues where you can't come in and sort of cure cancer in one stroke, right? It, it, it involves building on other people's contributions. It involves working in big teams. It involves, uh, you know, sequentially making that small step that when added up with a thousand other small steps ends up being that new vaccine or being that major discovery that uh, makes progress in uh, other diseases or cures our social ills. And so I think that balance of having the tenacity to stick with it and be inspired by the big picture goals, but not kind of feeling like, oh, I'm, uh, you know, just stuck in this mundane small thing and I want to be working on this big thing. I think that can at times get frustrating. So having that balance of inspiration so that you're working on something that really matters and motivates you and going back to one of your earlier questions can be something that drives you day to day while also having the tenacity to focus on the specific details that ultimately, you know, the technical work that's going to make a difference. I think that's those are the critical ingredients for research. And while I've given some examples in the in the biological and natural sciences, I think very much the same skills really matter in the social sciences as well. And increasingly, as the social sciences, you know, my area become a little bit more like the natural sciences as we have more data that makes the field more empirical, where we're seeing how the world works and testing theories. I think a lot of the same sets of skills uh, and issues become relevant there as well. Uh, well, you are the recipient of other highly acclaimed awards, such as the MacArthur Genius Fellowship uh, that's going well, and the John Bates Clark Medal in 2013. Uh, your work has already been influencing public policy, a federal bill authorizing $65 million to expand your pilot study to other cities uh, for the proposal for $5 billion US dollars in housing vouchers. You have definitely left your mark. Uh, what do you see as your legacy in your field of work and uh, what do you want to be? Yeah, well, I hope there's still a lot more to come and uh, what legacy there will be uh, will be defined uh, in the years to come. And I mean, I guess what I would hope ultimately is that our team's work, and I want to emphasize this is not, I don't view this as just my work, but I work with a very large group of collaborators who are fantastic and have contributed greatly to everything our team has done. And I hope our team's legacy will be that we inspire um, people to think about what can seem like political, complicated questions that are not really scientific questions in a more scientific way. So issues like how should we structure affordable housing policy or tax policy or how should we be thinking about inequality often become very politically divisive issues. Should we be giving more money to lower income folks in what form and so forth? What I hope we get to is a point where we can see some of those questions as having an important scientific component where there's just hard evidence on which types of policies work better and which types of policies don't. And while there will always be political factors that play into those kinds of decisions, that there's a starting point from a scientific evidence base that guides the discussion. Um, so I'm hoping that will be one contribution that comes out of our work. I also hope we will move the ball forward in the specific topics we're studying in terms of how to create more social mobility and upward mobility for all kinds of groups from uh, lower income folks to underrepresented racial minorities or disadvantaged caste groups in India and so forth. Um, and I hope, you know, while those problems are incredibly difficult to figure out, I, I hope when our work is done, we will be in a place with a better understanding of those issues uh, than where we started. And then finally, I hope we'll inspire a next generation of researchers and students to carry on uh, this work, because I think there's much, much more to be learned, much, much more to be improved. Uh, and the only way we can do that is by having many talented people work on these problems. This is a no well goal. More power to you, Professor.
uh, while talking about poverty and inequality, uh, you have said that you have the biggest impact on poverty by focusing on children. Uh, do you think it is true of a place like India and its problems with poverty and inequality? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my sense is uh, the, our findings, which focus primarily on U.S. data, but have been replicated in a number of other countries, are there's some general patterns there. There's some general truths about how the world works. And one of the things we've learned is that life trajectories are very heavily determined by the environment in which one grows up from birth until something like one's early 20s. That's really the set of formative years that shape where one ends up. Not that there's no, you know, that everything is determined after that point, but that seems like a central area to focus on if one wants to improve uh, long-term outcomes and reduce inequality or ultimately reduce poverty. And the way I think about it is a little bit like the old saying that it pays to teach a person how to fish rather than to give them a fish, right? Uh, when you teach a person, and by teaching, I mean not literally just in school, but what is the family environment like? What is the neighborhood environment like? What does the child aspire to do as an adult? Who do they see as their role models? Um, what are their values and so forth? I think all of those things, when one is in the right uh, environment, can put a person on a very different trajectory where poverty is addressed not directly by giving them more resources, which can be very hard to sustain on scale and get political support for, but rather because they have the skills to sort of fish for themselves, if you'd like, right? And so that's why I think focusing on the childhood years in many different ways, not just in the context of schools, is incredibly valuable. In the later ages, I do still think that there are challenges that we need to address that, you know, through bad luck, through health issues, through, you know, whatever happens in the world, there are people who end up, uh, and of course, it's very important to think about how we assist them as well. But in terms of having a sustainable long-term impact on inequality, I think tackling the problems in the childhood years really has the highest rate of return, which is the way an economist would think about it from an investment point of view. If I have a certain number of dollars as or rupees as the, as the government, where do I invest that? I get the highest rate of return, I think, investing in kids. Well, uh, many studies and perhaps commonly held beliefs say that it's later education that most influences earnings as an adult. Uh, your research finds that the quality of education as early as kindergarten equally impacts upward social mobility. Uh, could you please elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. So what we find in our work is that basically every extra year of exposure to better childhood environment matters roughly equally. So if you have a better teacher, say, in kindergarten or a better teacher in fifth grade or in eighth grade, each of those kind of additively contributes on average to better outcomes in adulthood, more likely to attend college, have a higher level of earnings, have a more stable life and so forth. Um, and so it's not about any particular set of years. There's some who have actually argued that it's just about the very earliest years right after birth. There are others who have argued, as you point out, that it's more about later education. You know, lots of parents, I think, focus on where kids are going to high school or college. But those early years are also very important because they shape a child's interests, I think, and cognitive skills and social skills, all things that matter a great deal later on. And so the key message that we emphasize in our work is to think about uh, opportunity is kind of a pipeline. So imagine a pipeline starting from birth and ending when you're in your mid-20s and kind of enter the, the labor market. And if there's a hole in that pipeline anywhere, you start to lose some of the talent, some of the development. So thinking about how you have a strong pipeline of opportunity throughout childhood is extremely valuable. Uh, Professor, besides education and poverty, your work identifies uh, family structures and social capital uh, to be the other two chief factors affecting upward social uh, mobility. How would you translate that to the family structures and social capital in India, which is quite different from uh, that in the US? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's an example of a, a type of set of factors where you might see different patterns in a place like India or in other communities relative to what we're seeing in the US. My intuition would be social capital, and let me just be precise And what does social capital mean? I think of it as who are you surrounded by, who are you connected to, 
Um, who are people who might help you if you need help? Who's in your community? My instinct is that is going to be important in any context in India as it is in the U.S. But the nature of social capital, as you're pointing out, might be different in India, where there are more extended families. There are different types of community structures, especially in, say, in villages. Uh, and so the way in which people get social capital might be different and the way in which we want to intervene to try to deliver more social capital might be different. But ultimately, the importance of social capital itself is something that is useful for advancement, I suspect, will be the same across societies. And so in that sense, I think a lot of these points have kind of a commonality across settings, but the specific implementation will, of course, have to depend upon the cultural context and the specific institutions in each area. Well, uh, even though uh, your work so far has primarily been focused on the United States, you've always been vocal about your heart for India. Uh, how do you foresee your work being applied here? So what I hope and what I'm actually seeing with some of our former graduate students here at Harvard who are carrying on similar work in India um, is that a lot of what we've been able to do in the U.S. and people are now doing in other developed countries, mapping economic opportunity, understanding where kids have the best chances of rising up in a very precise way, understanding which types of factors matter, what policies are most effective in changing those factors. I'm hoping that whole agenda can be carried out in India and other countries like it. Now, the key challenge, there's an additional challenge in India relative to a place like the U.S., which is getting the data that we use to, to tackle these problems, right? And so even in the US 10, 15 years ago, we didn't really have access to the data to do a lot of this work. So things can change very quickly. And I think with the uh, rapid change in technology, mobile technologies, for example, digital payment methods, you know, there's increasing ability to measure things very systematically, even in, uh, in countries that traditionally may have had less of a uh, tax data uh, core data sets that we can use to, to measure economic activity. And so I'm hopeful that creative researchers uh, like uh, these former students I mentioned, um, Paul Novosad and Sam Asher, who are now leading a big agenda of their own uh, studying these issues. I'm hoping that folks like that will be able to come up with similar techniques, if not identical in, in India and uh, really start to inform the public policy debate in a way that this work is informing the public policy debate in the U.S. And uh, well, as we uh, come to the end of this interview, Professor Chetty, we have a rather uh, Would you be able to tell us how winning the Infosys Prize has impacted you? I think winning the Infosys Prize, one of the nicest things about it is uh, having a connection to lots of people in India, getting a chance to give a lecture and hearing from many people in India who are interested in these issues, starting to learn more from conversations like this about uh, the types of issues that are on people's minds in India. And I think that's uh, always been something I've been interested in contributing to. I've been happy to be able to do this work in the US, but have also always wanted to try to have an impact in India and hopefully recruit more talented students from India who are interested in doing this sort of work may not be aware that you can do this type of research and have an influence on probably issues that lots of people in India are thinking about uh, in deploying the skills that I think a lot of people in India have in the computer science, statistics kind of technical space, but applying them to these social problems. Uh, and so it's given me a vehicle to try to uh, connect with uh, people in that regard and hopefully inspire a generation of students who will become the scientists who will uh, shape some of these issues in India going forward. Thank you so much, Professor Chetty. This was so encouraging to hear, and it's been uh, truly an honor talking to you, hearing about your work, your vision, and your heart for the impact that is research and uh, achieving everything that you have so far. So thank you so much, and we all hope that you continue to do so. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Swati. My pleasure. Thank you.